Hope everyone's having a good day today. Seems like the weather is really uh, nice outside, at least here in Deerfield where I am. Hope everyone is enjoying the weather today. Uh, I'm glad to have everyone here today. Uh, my name is John. I'm a physical therapist in uh, Deerfield, Illinois. Oh, great. We have a visitor from uh, India. Nice to have you here today. I will try to, <clears throat> as best as I can, uh, answer questions through the question answer and through the chat. So if you want to post it in the chat, you can do so. If you want to post it in the Q&A section, you can also do that. I'll try to check periodically um, and see if there are any questions along the way. Uh, please feel free to ask uh, during our webinar today. Um, it will be a very educational one, a lot of science, a little bit of history, um, and then we'll go into a few demonstrations later today. So um, we can get started. Here, I will share my screen here. Yeah, my name is uh, uh, John. I'm a physical therapist here in Deerfield, Illinois. Um, Today we're going to talk about the kinetic chain and the cross syndrome. We'll talk about what the kinetic chain is, uh, what that means for our body, and we'll get to specific examples with the cross uh, syndrome for the upper and lower. So our agenda today would be, uh, we'll look into the history of the kinetic chain, how that word came about, how that concept came about. We'll talk about uh, closed kinetic chain, what that means. Um, I saw we had a trainer here. I'm sure you are familiar with what a closed kinetic chain is. Open kinetic chain, what does that mean? The kinetic chain in our body, um, how that concept of the kinetic chain can affect our body as a whole. And then we'll look into some examples of the upper cross syndrome and lower cross syndrome. At the end, we'll summarize. If you have any questions, you can ask questions throughout. If not, if I don't see them throughout the the presentation, I will try to get to it at the end in our Q&A section. So let's jump right into it. Let's look at the history of the kinetic chain. So if you've ever um, you know, received uh, rehab or prehab or even training at the gym, you've probably heard of the term kinetic chain. Um, you might have heard terms like open kinetic chain, closed kinetic chain, or you know, the kinetic chain in our body. Um, what does that mean? Uh, well, the kinetic chain was first described by a mechanical engineer by the name of Franz Rillo. Um, he believed that all machines can be simplified into two, into chains of individual links called kinematic pairs. Kinematic is, uh, the definition of kinematic is the description of movement, how movement is described. He described it as two links that come in contact with each other and the motion between them is constrained. This offered a new way of studying machines and advancing technology into developing more advanced uh, mechanical machinery. So if you look at here, kinematic pair, two kinematic links, here's my mouse, um, connected through a constraint joint here, uh, making a kinematic pair. Uh, Relo uh, further added that movement produced by multiple kinematic pairs, multiple linkages of kinematic pairs uh, together can make up a kinetic chain. Here are some examples of that in machines. So we have kinematic pair, or kinet, uh, kinematic pair here and here, making a chain, same here. So we have all these little joints with kinematic pairs and them combined make a kinetic chain. Here are some other examples. We have a spherical one. Uh, we have a rectangular, kind of a planar one, kind of a cylindrical, corkscrewy, hinge type um, pairs. These are kinetic chains, so pairs that are connected together. Um, applied to all different machineries we see it in, in every life, in everyday life. Here's hinging of joints at a door. Um, here's some planar movements. Um, if you've seen this diagram, it seems very similar to our human body. So our joints in our human body are actually little kinematic pairs, and those linkages of that will make up a chain, a kinetic chain. 
So we have that hinge type joint here. We have that corkscrew up in our you know, atlas up, up top. We have a ball and socket, like a spherical one for our shoulders and our hips. We have planar ones in our tarsal bones. Um, so these mechanical uh, description of machinery joints can be applied to the human body. And that's actually what um, Dr. Stanwood did. He recognized and expanded this and applied it to the concept of human body and later in to exercise. He then introduced um, the open and closed kinetic chain in order to differentiate between two different exercise approaches. So one of that is the closed kinetic chain. Closed kinetic chain, Seidler reported that the body can be thought of as a system of rigid segments connected by a series of joints. Um, he defined the closed kinetic chain as a condition in which the terminal, the end segment, uh, meets considerable resistance. In other words, the distal end, the very far terminal end, is fixed to the environment. So here's an example of that. This is a squat, as you can see. So the foot is basically attached, fixed to the ground. Here's our kinematic pair, kinematic pair, kinematic pair, which makes our kinetic chain here from the hip, knee, and ankle. The TA, TKs, those are the torque of the knee, torque of the hip, uh, torque of the ankle. Here's the ground reaction force, force as the ground's pushing up. And here's our body weight here. So this is a closed kinetic chain because our linkages are closed to the ground. It's fixated to something that doesn't move, which is the ground. So instead of the ground moving, we're actually moving. We're squatting up. We're pushing our body weight up. And that's different than, here's some examples of kinetic chains. we got the squat, we've got lunges, right? Pushing the ground, pushing the ground, push up, pushing the ground, and also pull-ups. So we're pulling ourselves up to something that's fixated. So we have uh, some examples of closed kinetic chain. Terminal segment not moving, fixed. Um, example squats, there we go, lunges, um, push ups, and also pull ups. So the ground fixated, 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 and our hands are, are fixated to uh, whatever we're hanging on. Closed system, closed kinetic chain. What about the open kinetic chain? Open kinetic chain is the exact opposite. This was described uh, by Dr. Sandler as a motion where the terminal segment is free to move in space. So it's not fixated on something that is closed. So the distal end of the extremity is not fixed to an object. So different from that squat example that we saw, um, here the foot is free, moving along in space. So we have the weight of the leg, here's the torque of the knee and the muscle of the quad will pull the leg up. Not fixated to the ground, it's open to the environment. So what can I change? Some examples of that is just like- this. Examples of leg curls, bench press, right? We're pressing the weight, bicep curls. Here's a hamstring curl, free, open, not fixated to anything, moving the extremity. Bench press, we're lying on the bench, we're moving the weight through space, not fixated on something. It goes almost like a row, um, kind of like a TRX or inverted push-up type row, and yeah, that would probably be kind of a close kinetic chain. And here's my bicycle. We're moving and curling the weight um, in space. So open kinetic chain versus the closed kinetic chain. So why is that important? Um, kinetic chain in our body, so what, who cares? You know, one's in space, one stuck to the ground, um, but it has a, you know, big significance in how we understand muscle cellular injury and the health of our muscle cellular system. Um, this concept helps us to understand that the joints in the body can cause dysfunction elsewhere in the body. Uh, if you've seen our other webinars or if you've been with us here, you know that um, we look at the body as a whole, how the foot affects ankle and knee mechanics, how the thoracic spine can affect our shoulder girdle, our shoulder joint, right? And how the position of our pelvis can affect our hips and everything down that kinetic chain, right? So it's 
looking at one thing, but knowing that that area can cause and affect other parts of our body. The concept of the kinetic chain in the human body addresses only the joints such as the ankle, knee, hip, elbow, shoulder joint, but the human body is not simply a joint, right? It's not just made up of bones connected at joints. There are many other structures that link these bones together, right? We have muscle, we have ligaments, we have tendons, we have capsules, all these soft tissues link our bones together in one kinetic pair, but those are also connected uh, through bones, uh, muscle, tendon, ligaments to make a kinetic chain. So in order to address the entire kinetic chain, uh, muscle flexibility, joint capsule tightness, fascial restrictions along with bones and joints have to be taken into consideration. Can't just look at one little area and fix a problem. You might improve someone's symptoms, but you can't fix the overall problem, why that problem originated in the first place if you don't look at the entire body, the entire kinetic chain, right? So well, let's look at some examples. To the upper and lower cross syndrome, now that we know that one joint can affect another joint along this kinetic chain, um, and we also talked about how soft tissue surrounding a joint such as muscle, ligament, tendon, and the joint capsule can be considered when addressing the kinetic chain. And a good example of this is the upper and lower crossed syndrome. If you, if I were to summarize this, it's basically tightness in one area leading to weakness in another area. And this can turn affect posture, it can affect the joint mechanics, it can affect um, muscle efficiency, how well a muscle can fire, your strength of your muscle. Um, it can affect a lot of things up or down that kinetic chain because um, as we just saw, everything is connected in our body. So let's look at upper uh, cross syndrome. Uh, it refers to a muscle imbalance that happens in the upper body, so the shoulders and neck. Uh, the muscles are tight in the upper kinetic chain are uh, upper trapezius, levator scapulae, both of those elevate our shoulder blade and the pec major and the pec minor. So we're probably familiar with those muscles. Um, those are the muscles that are shortened or tight. And now the muscles that are lengthened because these muscles are shortened and tight um, are the deep neck flexors on so front of your neck, deep in here, and then the lower trapezius, right? So our scapula is elevated because of tightness in our upper trap, our levator scap. The muscles that depress our shoulder blade are lengthened. They're stretched up because it's pulling up. Again, everything's connected. We have this kinetic chain reaction. If uh, one joint is doing something, there are consequences for the other joints up and down the chain, right? So here's a good example, a picture of that. So we have tight muscles here, upper trapezius. We have the levator scap, those are tight, pulling the shoulder blade up. We have tight pecs, kind of rounding the shoulder forward, right? That tightness in this axis here can lead to weakness in the deep cervical flexors, the rhomboids, the lower trap, right? Because they're pulled and they're at a, we call it a muscle insufficiency. They're at an insufficient length. Every muscle, has an ideal length tension relationship. If a muscle is too slack, then it can't fire as well. You can't use that muscle to its full potential. If it's too stretched out and too lengthened, you can't use that muscle to its full potential either. It has to be at that perfect range where you can maximize force, uh, maximize that muscle contraction. So if a muscle is weak, AKA lengthened, or it could be shortened, then you're not using these muscles, which are really important for uh, posture, right? So upper cross syndrome, why is that important is, you know, we have our body, 
look at this picture here. Um, probably seems really familiar to you. It's a slumped, kind of a slouched position. We've been doing a lot of Zoom calls, uh, spending more time probably in front of the computer. Um, and you've seen this quite often, where you have the tight pegs, you have the tightness in the upper traps, um, you have tightness in the suboccipital muscles up here. And then, because of that tightness, we have a lot of weakness. Weakness in the lats, weakness in the lower trap, serious interior, weakness in the deep uh, neck cervical flexors, right? Um, and you can see how that head is so much far forward. Uh, this can be problematic, actually, if every inch that the head is forward from midline, and midline can be measured where the auditory, the external auditory meatus, and the acromium are in line. So that's uh, typically uh, how they would measure that. And every inch is forward from that line, your, your head weighs an extra 10 pounds. Right? So every time, every inch that it, it's forward, that head weighs an extra 10 pounds. I mean, in this diagram here, this, this person's head is, you know, four, four or five inches, probably forward. That's an extra 40 pounds that these small little neck muscles have to really strain to hold your head up straight so you can look forward. Um, that is a lot of weight for these small muscles to hold that up. We end up with problems such as neck pain, you know, headaches, tension type headaches, cervicogenic headaches, headache from, from the neck. Um, of course, it doesn't help with our shoulders too. Um, if you can try this, if you really slouch down, really round your shoulders and slouch, if you try to lift that arm up, you know, it doesn't really work. You can't lift it up all the way. You feel bony blockage, it might even hurt your shoulders. But if I'm able to have an erect posture here, get my shoulders back, um, and maintain a good posture, I can lift my arm up all the way no problem. Right? So um, the shoulder blade. This is what I'm talking about here. So watch this guy's shoulder blade. You see asymmetries between left and right. And you see here that downward rotation is not controlled on that left arm. Nice and smooth here. As the arm is coming down, the shoulder blade is moving with it. Pretty good ratio, it's usually a two to one ratio. Every two degrees the arm moves, the shoulder blade would move a degree. But here, clearly, it's uh, not moving the same way. There are 18 muscles that attach to our shoulder blade. So um, if that shoulder blade is out of place, it's not in good position because we're slouched, we have this upper cross syndrome where our head is forward, shoulders are rounded, our thoracic spine is rounded. Um, it really affects the way our shoulders move. and we're still going to get the work done. We're still going to reach over. We're still going to get our activities. Um, we're still doing our chores. We're still doing our work. But it's not optimal. As you can see in this shoulder, it's not optimal. He can get his arm up all the way. He can move it down, but that's not optimal. And if he were to do this hundreds, hundreds of times, maybe with some load, I'm reaching, I'm grabbing, I'm holding something up, it's going to end up with some, you know, he's going to end up with some problems. It's going to be some pain in his shoulder, right? So. It's not heavy load that's needed, it's a repetitive motion with poor mechanics like that shoulder, because you're in such bad posture, that can lead to instabilities in the shoulder. It can lead to neck and arm pain, rotator cuff dysfunction, um, and even degeneration of the joint cartilage. Uh, I'm thinking about uh, wear and tear of, more wear and tear of certain areas of the joint. If you think about a tire, Maybe that's overinflated or underinflated, so not inflated to its uh, spec. It wears differently. You don't get an even wear. You might get wear in the middle. You might get wear on the outside, right? So if our mechanics are off, we're going to get wear in certain spots. And with repetitive movement, reaching, grabbing, pulling, repetitive movement throughout the day, it wears on our joint. It can degrade our cartilage. It can impinge and singe our muscles, right? It can shred our muscle tendons. So um, it can cause a lot of problems in the long run. And if you're lifting weights, that's 
making it even worse. You're going to exacerbate that, uh, that movement. What about the lower cost syndrome? Um, it's basically the same as the upper, but into our lower body, into our pelvis and our legs. So the muscles that are tight and shortened in the lower cross syndrome. Are the hip flexors. Uh, the low back extensors, the lumbar extensors and subsequently the muscles that are lengthened or weak the abdominals, particularly the lower abdominals um, and the gluteus maximus, that's the glute muscle, we're all familiar with that. Here's a kind of a diagram of that. So we have the weak abdominals here. We have weak glutes here because we have tightness in our thoracolumbar, so our low back here, and in our hip flexors. So that's that cross, the cross syndrome for the lower body. And this will look familiar to you here too. So what does that mean for us? Here's that picture here. Does that look familiar for you? Um, this is kind of a severe case, but uh, you get the idea here. We got lumbar lordosis, that tight low back muscle here, that tight hip flexors here, gives us that lumbar curve, hyper lordosis, increased lumbar lordosis, right? And then we got anterior pelvic tilt because of that. Now we have lengthening of our glutes here. Can't fire my glutes. My glutes are very weak. I have lengthening in my abdominals. My abdominals are very weak. I can't, I can't fire those. And then since it's our body's a kinetic chain, we got you know trouble down down here. We're in knee flexion here. Knee flexion will cause us to overuse our quads. Oh, we got kinetic chain up here. Thoracic hyperkyphosis, meaning a more of a convex type curve. Doesn't that curve look like something that we saw in the upper cross syndrome? That little rounded shoulders, right? Rounding of the shoulders, increased thoracic kyphosis, kinetic chain, so it's all connected. So um, this optimal pelvic, this anterior pelvic tilt, it causes a whole host of uh, problems up and down and locally at the lumbopelvis at the low back, low back pain, hip SI pain. Um, and then subsequently up top, thoracic pain, shoulder pain, down, knee pain, ankle pain, right? Um, this back positioning adds a lot of stress to uh, the low back because you're unable to stabilize the core with your abdominals. You can't stabilize your pelvis this way because you can't use your glutes, right? Try this. If you were to stand up, if you're able to stand up where you are, let me see if I can get this here. So if I'm in that position here and I'm pretending that the, my hip flexors are tight right here and bending forward from my hip, try to squeeze your glutes in this kind of four flex position. Try to squeeze your glute. It's near impossible to squeeze my glute. Even if I really thought about it, even if I tried, I trying to think about squeezing my glutes, if my hip is bent forward like this, I actually cannot squeeze my glutes well. My weight is more on the front of my foot, not on the back of my feet, um, and I can't squeeze my glute. Now, if I were to relax my hip flexors and stand more upright, tuck my pelvis under, so instead of anterior tilt, I posterior tilt, I can squeeze my glute easily, right? So that's what we're talking about when we're talking about the length uh, tension relationship is my glutes are lengthened. They're stretched because I'm in this anterior pelvic rotation. So I can't squeeze my glute. Also, I can't engage my abdominals here because it's so stretched up. I can't even squeeze my abdominals. But if I'm in a more neutral spine, my pelvis is stuck under, I can really squeeze my abs, right? So um, that length tension relationship, and why is that important is uh, core, 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 right? Core is so important to um, help prevent low back pain, even hip pain, knee pain, right? We need a good core. The foundation of our body is our core. I like to give this example that 
our core is the foundation, like any building foundation. If we have um, the best builder to build this building, we have the best materials of the world to build this building, but we have a really weak uh, foundation. The core is very weak. The foundation is very weak. It doesn't matter how well you built that structure. That foundation crumbles, everything is coming down. I don't care who built it. I don't care what materials you used, it's gonna come down, right? Same with our core. Doesn't matter how strong my arms are, doesn't matter how strong my legs are. If my core is weak, if my foundation is weak, I'm gonna end up getting hurt somewhere uh, along the line because I'm unable to utilize the strength in my arms and legs because this is so weak. My cores are weak. So what can you do to avoid these cross syndromes, upper and lower cross syndromes, right? If you really think about it, it's getting out of that position, so stretching and releasing the muscles that are so short and tight and also strengthening the ones that are really lengthened, right? So strengthening muscles that are lengthened, that are weak. Um, that's what we can do to prevent cross syndromes. So if I'm upper cross syndrome, I can do everything for upper body, lower cross syndrome, I can do things for the lower body. So what can we do for the upper body? Well, we can do pec release. So if I did that, um, let me grab my ball. So for our pec release, I have a little lacrosse ball here. Um, we can get into our pecs here and pin it up against the wall. So I can pin it up against the wall here. Right against the wall. And I can internal and external rotate. I can go up and down, I can punch forward or internal or external, external rotate. A pec is a internal rotator, so by internal rotate, I should be engaging that pec. I external rotate, I should be stretching that pec. Um, engaging and relaxing, contracting and relaxing that muscle um, is better than just trying to stretch or roll out um, passively that muscle. I'm getting a neuromuscular response, right? I'm engaging that muscle, I'm relaxing that muscle while I put external pressure. So it's really good with that. So upper cross syndrome, we got this here. What else we gotta do? Gotta get out of this rounded position, right? So we gotta do scapular retractions. That is simply, as it says, and retracting our shoulder blades. Retracting our shoulder blades. What I'm thinking about when I'm doing this is trying to squeeze my shoulder blades together, but also down. Remember how the upper trap elevator can get tight? So it goes elevated position. We want to down and then back. So down and back. I'll have to give it a good uh, one Mississippi hold just so I know I'm, I'm squeezing that muscle, not just going through the movement. I'm, it's meaningful, it has purpose to the movement. So I'm squeezing down and back together, right? So you can do this anywhere, you can do this between emails, between commercials. Sometimes I do it at red lights, if I'm in the car, you can do this anywhere. Same with this exercise of chin tucks. So we have that forward head that we saw on the upper cross syndrome. And every inch that head is in front of our body, it's 10 pounds added. So we want to get this out. I always want to start with good posture first. That should fix most of that neck. And then just retracting the chin. It's making like a double chin. So it's not looking up, it's pulling it back. Almost like there's a string that's attached to your head and that string is pulling you up, pulling you up this way, pulling you up. So it's a retraction. Good posture first. I'm here, slouched. It's really hard to just even retract in this position. I can't even talk. All right, so we want to be in a good position here. Retract. 
and you don't have to stick it out and then retract. It's just you can relax, retract, relax, and retract. So I'm making a double chin. All right, so pec release, we're getting out of this rounded shoulder, scat retractions. Releasing that pec first helps us to get this back, right? Once I get this back, helps me to get this back, right? So pec first, get that pec, get that released. Now I can open up my chest, squeeze those shoulder blades down and back, do sets of those. Now that I'm in good posture, I can reach out my chin, right? So sometimes the order does matter how you do things. If I try to go to the chin tucks in, in this position and my pecs are tight, can you get my shoulders back because it's so tight? You can't even chin tuck, right? So sometimes the order of the way it goes doesn't matter. So what about the lower cross syndrome? You get flexor release. Right, now I'm gonna get out to the floor. Let me take you guys all to the floor here. So I'm gonna have to wear a mask since we're going out to the floor. We have our other therapist here, so. Okay, I got that same ball, and we're gonna do a hip flexor release. Specifically, we're gonna do the TFL, which is right across here. So never on a bone, never on a joint. So I'm getting that muscle belly right at my hip. Hopefully you can see that there, right here. So have that ball here. I'm gonna line a mat. Get some pressure onto that ball. Yep, that's a tender spot for me. I'm gonna bend that leg, and then internally and externally rotate. Hip flexors are internal rotators, just like our pecs are for our shoulders. Internal and external rotate while I keep that pressure on my hip flexor. Okay, just like that. Typically I do maybe 30 reps. Or until I feel, yeah, it's not as sore, it's not as tender, and I can stop. Important is never on a bone and never on a joint. We want to avoid those two spots. So I'm going to get out of this position, all right? So we want to release and relax that hip flexor so we can open it up, all right? So our next one is our QL release. QL is actually part of that lumbar extensor, the lumbar paraspinals and the low back. So it's the tightness here. I wanna release that muscle so I can get into this position here. So I'm gonna put the ball right in my low back. Not on a bone, not on a joint, so I'm not gonna put it on the spine, I'm gonna put it right next to the spine where that muscle bulk is. So put it right where that muscle bulk is. I'm gonna lie down on the ball, trying to find a spot that's under. Yep, ouch. I'm gonna lay on it here. I'm gonna cross that leg over, it's on my left side. I'm gonna cross the left leg over the right. That puts a little more and more pressure to the ball. I'm gonna just swing my leg side to side. You can also try to posture the pelvic tilt and put more pressure into the ball. We'll take that leg side to side. You can do 30 rocks or until you feel like, yeah, I don't feel it as much. And you can move on to the next. So we got the hip flexors. We got the QL muscles. Next, glute bridges. So we got to strengthen uh, the muscles that are weak. Probably have done plenty of these. On your back. Low back is flat. I'm gonna push through with my heels. So my 
feet are flat, I'm going to exaggerate it by doing this. You don't have to, but I'm just going to show you that I'm pushing through my heels, lift my butt off the ground, and then back down. I want you to do it with your foot flat, but push your weight through the heel and lift your foot up. One other thing that I like to cue people is not to roll down. I don't know if you can see that, but it's like rolling up and rolling down. That defeats the purpose of this glute bridge. I'm not, I'm not using my glutes if I do this. I want to keep that spine nice and stable. Go up as a unit and down as a unit. So I'm hinging only from my hips, pushing through my heels. I feel that in my glute, a little bit in my upper hamstrings. So got the hip flexor, got the QL. If we release those muscles, we're in a better position, right? It's just like how we released our pec muscle and we're able to retract our shoulder blades. I want to release these muscles first before I to do these exercises. I can get into a better position, get out of that lower cross syndrome looking position, right? That rounded shoulder, the anterior pelvic tilt, the increased lumbar lordosis. I want to get out of those positions first so that when I do exercises, such as glute bridges or shoulder retractions or chin tucks, I'm using the right muscles. Right? We, we just talked that the glutes are weak for the lower cross syndrome. The lower traps are weak for the upper cross syndrome. The deep cervical neck flexors are weak in the lower cross syndrome. We want to be able to uh, do those, uh, strengthen those muscles. Hollow body hold is a, another ab exercise so we want to be able to strengthen our abs it's a plank that's on your back so being able to hold that hollow body position we want to strengthen those abs right strengthen glutes strengthen abs for the lower cross syndrome uh, strengthen deep cervical neck flexors and strengthen the low trap sorry anterior the backs for our upper cross syndrome so what is the take home message from our discussion today? Um, we have, our body is comprised of multiple joints, kin kinematic links, kinematic uh, pairs that make up a kinetic chain, right? No joint is independent of each other. Every joint is connected somehow. We talked about through muscle, tendon, ligament, um, capsules, right? We're all connected somehow. Um, and through that connection, I can affect other joints, right? If I'm able to extend at my hip, I can fix my pelvic position. I can fix my low back curve. If I open up my chest, I can fix the slouched position. I can fix my neck position, right? Just affecting one joint will in turn affect something else. Um, like I said, we have a lot of ligaments, muscles, capsules that we have to address. So we can't just look at a joint. If I'm unable to get to a certain position, you have to ask, why can't I get there? Is it a joint issue, the joint capsule? Is it the muscle that's pulling on the joint, right? So uh, looking at a global picture, not just, oh, that joint hurts or I have you know, joint pain there. And we talked about some examples of the upper and lower cross syndrome and how it can cause a bunch of different problems. And it's very, uh, you know, you can see it a lot. It's typical. We see these slouched forehead postures. We see that lumbar lordosis, right? Anterior pelvic tilt. We see that a lot because it's a problem that uh, we face as we sit a lot. We sit and work. We sit in the car. We sit and eat. Sit on the toilet. We have to sit sometimes, but um, we can do exercises to prevent it. We can do releases, we can do mobilizations to prevent or even maybe slow that curve, right? If you have any questions, I can take that now. I haven't really checked if there are any questions, but if anyone has questions, you can put it in the chat.
Oh, I'm sorry. I just saw that the audio, I hope, hopefully the audio was good. Just saw your message now. I didn't know that the audio was in and out. I'll give you a few seconds if you need to write your questions down. If you have questions about anything that we went over today. Okay, thank you. Didn't. It's probably the room that I'm in. It's a. It's kind of a closed space. Okay, we have a question here. How much does it? How much does it? How much does the lower cross syndrome affect running and jumping? Well, if you think about, that's a great question. If you think about the cross syndrome and what muscles are weak, and what muscles. Uh, are tight, right? We know that the weak muscles are weak because they're insufficient. You can't flex that muscle. If I'm bent forward here, I can't flex my glute. If I'm jumping and running, what muscles do I want to use? Do I want to use my low back muscles? Do I want to use my hip flexors? I want to use my glutes and hamstrings, you know, some of the big muscle groups, you know, the type two fast twitch muscles for jumping, right, and sprinting. So if I can't use those muscles because of the positioning of my joints, I'm going to compensate. I'm going to use muscles that I probably have been using, have been overworked. I'm going to use those muscles. And now I'm going to start getting into that repetitive strain. I'm going to strain muscles that are tired, fatigued, overworked, and that can cause problems. But also think about that, that wear and tear I was talking about earlier. If our joints aren't moving the way they should mechanically, then I'm going to add extra stress and wear and tear in areas of the joint that probably don't need that much wear and tear, right? I want a uniform wear and tear, not certain parts of the joint. So it's very, you know, it can affect your running and jumping, especially the longevity. Hopefully that answered your question. Thank you for that. Can upper cross syndrome also contribute to jaw pain? Yes. Yes, it does. I see a lot of patients with TMJD, temporal mandibular joint dysfunction. If you can do this yourself here. If I stick my head forward, my mouth automatically opens up and separates a little bit. It separates this way and opens up a little bit. You could do that yourself right now on the computer. If I stick my head forward, my jaw loosens up and my bite is off, right? If I'm chronically stuck in this position, I'm eating, chewing, right? Chewing gum, chewing something. I can cause a lot of TMJD, right? cause inflammation in, in, in your joints. So you're still gonna chew, you're still gonna eat. Again, that repetitive motion, repetitive strain, repetitive stress is gonna wear on joints, gonna overuse muscles that are overworked and cause strain in those muscles or the joint or the capsule, right? Or the cartilage in the joint. We have a little disc in here. It can really inflame that disc in our TMJ. So, Yes, that can contribute to jaw pain. Uh, even a good fix for if someone has TMJD, a good fix is just those chin, chin tucks. It does wonders for someone with chin, TMJD, just doing those chin tucks. And you'll see that their mouth opens and closes better just by putting them into a better position with their shoulder and neck. We have another question here. So while running, can upper cross syndrome and lower cross syndrome be interconnected? Yes. Right. We saw that um, the lower cross body syndrome, we have that lumbar lordosis, that inter, that, that crazy lordotic curve right, in our lumbar spine. To compensate for such a curve here, you start to round up here. It's hard for me to do it. But you start to round up here. If I round up on my thoracic spine, what am I doing up here? Yeah, I'm, I'm in the upper cross syndrome, right? So what came first, here or here? I don't know, right? We're sitting a lot, we're on the computer a lot. Cell phone, computer, right? I'm always here. I'm never back here. I'm sitting a lot. So did the lower body, you know, lower cross syndrome come first and then the upper body or the upper, the lower? Who knows, same time, maybe, right? But um, it can affect running. It can affect lifting too, any kind of lifts. If you're lifting weights, 
in this position or in this position with the lower body, that's going to hurt, especially if you're lifting heavy loads. Um, it's not going to feel good. You can get it done, but you're doing three, three sets of 12, three sets of eight, doing that consistently and not fixing your position, your posture, um, that's going to hurt. It's going to lead to some injury, overuse type injuries, right? Shoulder impingement. I'll think of this right here. Ouch. I can't even lift my arm. All right? And I'm doing presses overhead. Ouch. That hurts. Same thing with the, uh, the lower body. I'm trying to do squats and I can't even get into a neutral spine position when you're putting load on. That's going to hurt my back, eventually hurt my hip too. Great questions. Thank you for your question. Hopefully I answered your questions. If I didn't, please let me know. Okay, sorry about the echo and maybe the audio and video issues. I uh, apologize for that. Hopefully um, you were able to get the gist of it. Okay, so hopefully everyone's in good posture right now while watching this webinar. Hopefully you're able to get up and do some of these exercises. Get yourself a nice tool like a lacrosse ball. Um, if the lacrosse ball is too stiff, you can use a tennis ball if you have a tennis ball at home. So um, any of those work. Carry it around with you on vacation too. No big deal. Chin tucks, scap retractions, glute bridges, hollow holds. Um, you can do that anywhere, right? You don't need any type of equipment. You can be anywhere. Hope everyone enjoyed uh, this webinar. Um, my name is John. I'm at the Deerfield location. We uh, react. We have six different locations in the Chicago land area. We also do have uh, telehealth appointments as well. Um, you can book online of any of our six locations. I'm in the Deerfield location, but if you're in the city, we have plenty of city locations. So. Um, my email is also down here. My phone number is down here as well. So you can contact me through that if you have any additional questions. Um, thank you guys for attending. Um, let's see this chat here. A little question here. Uh, we definitely uh, got a question here. Can I ask, can I, as a strength and conditioning uh, work as an intern? We definitely take a lot of shadows. We're a teaching institution here. So uh, we have a lot of students. We take in uh, physical therapy students. We've taken in volunteers that are uh, pursuing health and wellness or even pursuing PT. Um, we take a lot of shadows and volunteers. So. Uh, yes, uh, you can definitely come in and shadow, ask questions, um, be uh, physical right here. So do stuff here. So yes, you can uh, come and shadow and, and, and work as a volunteer if you would like. Uh, any of our city locations, any of our locations. So. All right, I, think, uh, I don't think anyone else has questions. So if you do, um, think of something at, outside this webinar. This webinar is recorded, it'll be posted online in our events uh, page on bereact.com. So you can review uh, this webinar and our previous webinars. You can email me if you think of a question later or call. Um, you can visit any of our websites, um, any of our locations. Uh, we offer all, uh, free screens. So if you want to get screened for your upper or lower cross syndrome, what muscles are tight, what muscles are weak, uh, we can screen you for those. Um, those are complimentary screens. So we have telehealth. We do complimentary screens. Uh, we also can book online if you want to book online. Okay. 
Thank you so much, everyone, for attending and being part of uh, this webinar. Hope everyone enjoys the weather and their day today. And hopefully everyone is having a good time uh, despite all the challenges that we face. So I uh, wish everyone well and good health and hopefully see you soon. Take care, everyone.